Hi, this is Terry. We're doing statement of cash flows, and I think what I'll do is just jump right into what the statement of cash flows is and bypass about a half an hour worth of why did it happen, you know, WT grant, efficient market hypothesis, and all these other issues. So if we take the income statement, income, whoops, income statement, statement of retained earnings, and the balance sheet, that gives us a picture of how well the company is doing on an accrual basis. And the statement of cash flows is different because what it does is it restates these documents based on the flow of cash. And we talk about an inflow as being a source and an outflow as being a use. Okay? So let me get rid of this little dots and keep moving here. There's three sections to the statement of cash flows. The first section is cash from operations. Second section is cash from whoops from investing. And the third section is cash from financing. So cash from operations is all let me go ahead and write this out from operations or operating activities um, it is all about what's happening in the current period so by definition cash from operations is going to involve the current assets and current liabilities cash from investing is all about long-term assets and cash from financing activities is all about long-term liabilities and owners equity this cash from operations is a little, or operating activities is a little bit involved because we can do the direct method. Oh, we can do the direct method, and I slipped here. Let me see if I can get this to go up. Well, doesn't matter. Cash from operations can be the direct method or the indirect method. And the issue there is the FASB says the direct method is preferred. That's the one that they like. But if you do the direct method, you have to do the indirect method to prove it. And so why not just do the indirect method, and then you don't have to do them both. All right. Uh, the, the cash from operations then, cash from operating activities, starts out with a concept, and they say, all right, net income is going to be our, the equivalent of our cash from operations. And there's a couple things you got to remember. One is that when we have the three sections, cash from operating, investing, and financing, we're going to add the beginning January 1st cash and the changes in these three sections plus the beginning cash is going to tell us why we ended up on the balance sheet with the ending balance of cash. In other words, if we've got year one and year two and we've got $100 here and $105 there, we're going to be explaining why the change was a net of five. Okay, so back to cash from operations. We're going to start and say, okay, net income is our starting point. That's how much cash we got from operating activities. We know that that's not true, but what we're going to do is run through five rules to convert that net income back to a cash basis. What you have to keep in mind is that when we do revenue or sales minus our expenses is net income, that the revenue and expenses are based on an accrual basis and we're trying to convert this net income figure back to cash. Well, rule number one is to add back depreciation. And the idea here is we recorded depreciation expense but it doesn't use cash. So if we're going to say a net income is how much cash we have, it's not true because we'd already previously subtracted out depreciation expense. So to get that back to a cash basis, we have to reverse it and add depreciation back in. Rule number two then becomes um, that our current assets are inversely related. So as they go up, we subtract. As they go down, we add. And the way that works is probably easiest seen with journal entries in a T account 
is we will record, uh, say, uh, accounts receivable of $100 and sales of 100 So if we look in a T account for accounts receivable, we started with 10 we just added 100 If the ending balance in that account is 5 then we must have had a journal entry that recorded cash of 105 and accounts receivable 105. So we must have received $105 in cash. 10 was our beginning. We added 100, so we have 110, right? If there's five left that that people still owe us, then we must have received $105. So in other words, we received this change here, this change of five. We received five dollars more than what was charged in the current period for our account balance to go down. So since our net income figure, this revenue or sales, this net income figure has already incorporated this hundred dollars in sales, for us to get it to the correct amount, we have to look at this change and see that it's five dollars less that it's gone down and since it's gone down then we need to add five more dollars to that balance. The third item then is current liabilities and they're directly related if we if the beginning to ending balance goes up we add the difference if the ending balance beginning to ending balance goes down then we subtract it that issue, and let me use my little eraser here again and see if I can erase all this. Is it going to erase? I'm trying. Blop, 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 blop. Okay, that's kind of erased. We'll see what happens. All right, we would record oops, uh, some type of expense and accounts payable, then accounts payable and cash. Well, just because we record an expense of a hundred doesn't mean that we paid all of that off. So, if we're looking at we're, we've recorded a hundred, but the cash has gone down ninety, then if we look at all the current liability accounts, so accounts payable, taxes payable, interest payable, then if it goes up, we have more cash. If it goes down, we have less, and that should make sense because if our bills have gone up obviously we have more cash because we're not paying our bills we're recording this expense we're just not paying out the cash so therefore our accounts payable has gone up if we just haven't paid this out then of course we have more cash the fourth rule then is um, the same as rule number three it's taxes payable which behaves in the same way because it's separated out because it's taxes but it's it's a liability so it's going to behave in the same direction and then rule number five gains are subtracted losses are added so when we take off say accumulated depreciation and I'm just going to make up numbers of 90 and we take off some piece of equipment that's a hundred and somebody gives us cash of 30 well then we got a gain on sale of 10. That gain is a paper gain. There's there's no cash received. The cash of 30 is cash, but the gain itself is not cash. And since we have to record that in our net income, right? We have our revenues minus expenses is net income and this gain has gone in as a revenue item then what we have to do is subtract it out because we never got cash for the gain. We got cash for the cash but not cash for the gain. When we get all done then the beginning net income whatever that dollar value is plus these five changes gives us our cash from operating activities. All right. What I'd like to do then is switch to the rest of the Transparency Masters that I've uploaded into the website and show you the publisher's view. So I'm going to run through these quickly. The purpose statement of cash flows is to show the major uses and sources of cash, right? Anything that's going to be converted into cash within 90 days, so less than 90 days, 
that just gets counted as cash to begin with. They call it cash equivalent. So any short, short-term, highly liquid investments like treasury bills, commercial paper, money market funds, by the time December 31st um, occurs, and then out here is when you publish your financial statements. So we got 1231, and maybe we don't publish them out to the outside world till the middle of March. Then a lot of that, those cash equivalents have been converted to cash in this time period. Well, the way that you can take care of it is to take all of these short-term investments and just count them as cash right from the beginning. All right, let's move on. We're going to skip this page and skip this page if you're following along. Here's just a repeat that we have three sections, cash from operating activities, which can be done under the direct or the indirect method. Right? It's current assets and current liabilities. Then we have investing, which is going to be the non-current assets, which is the same thing as saying long-term assets and financing which is going to be uh, involve creditors and owners so that's long-term liabilities and owners equity again we can do the direct or the indirect method we're going to do the indirect and then it says okay here's all the different steps here's all the different steps for you in preparing the statement of cash flows so what we would do is we would turn around and take our balance sheet and we would show the two years. Then what we're going to do is, is show the change here. So we would say whether we're plus or minus whatever the difference is. So if we go from 9 to 8, then that goes down 1. If we go 15 to 21, that goes up 6, etc. So we run through all of our accounts, all of our balance sheet accounts. Then we need to know our net income figure because that's our starting point. We're going to need to know what dividends are paid out from our uh, statement of retained earnings. So there's our step one and two that we've got all of the, the changes recorded. We keep track of our list of all those accounts. Then we decide whether it's a source or a use. Well, that's where you follow um, those five rules by looking at the current assets and current liabilities and do they go up or the, do they go down. And then we'll look at the long-term assets, long-term assets, long-term liabilities and owner's equity. And I'm just going to get you to a final statement here because that'll be the easiest. So in this particular situation, we're turning around saying, okay, our net income was $19. Then step one, we're going to add back depreciation. Step two, we're going to look at all of our current assets. So our current assets in this abbreviated textbook example is accounts receivable and inventory. So if accounts receivable goes down, we add it. If inventory goes up, we subtract it. Step three, then, is our... Um, current liabilities. So if they increase, we add because remember they're directly related. If they're decreased, we subtract them. Then step four is our taxes payable. If taxes payable go up, we add it. And then gains are subtracted. So when we turn around and say how much cash came from operating activities, well net income was 19, but cash from operating is 25. And if you think, you know, if you stop and think, well, what if this was done in billions of dollars? Well, is six billion dollars significant? Well, yeah, you'd make different different decisions if you use net income to make decisions, and didn't look at the cash flow, then you'd be missing part of the picture. The, in the traditional classroom, what I do is I pick on a student and I say, you know, she has children. And so to the children, she's the mother, but to her parents, she's the daughter. Well, it's the same person, but it's two different la ways of looking at uh, you know, her as a person. Then that's the same deal here. $19 is how we're looking at the company from a, an accrual basis, but $25 is how much cash we generated from a cash basis. Then we look at our investing activities. So the, the next two sections to me are just common sense. If you go out and build more plant and equipment, go out and buy more equipment, then of course you have less cash. If you sell a piece of equipment, then it's a cash inflow. 
and for financing activities. If you sell more bonds, people give you cash. If you sell more stock, people give you cash. But if you pay out dividends, then it's a use of cash. If we take those net changes, so 25, 26, 8, then the net change is positive 7. If we take that January 1st balance of 6, we now have the 1231 balance of 13. So the first step is to make the mechanics of all this. The second step is to, is to make the interpretation. So we turn around and say, okay, our investing activities use 26. Well, what paid for that? Well, we could turn around and say that our current operating situation paid for most of that use of cash and that a little bit of it was supported from financing activities. When we go back up here and look and say, okay, where did that money come from? Well, we increased our inventory by six, and the issue here is that if we're doing the exact same sales as last time, so in year one we had X number of sales, in year two we had X number of sales, and those two are fundamentally the same, we shouldn't need any additional inventory just for the same amount of sales. The fact that inventory went up, we, we'd have to question that. We'd have to have a little red flag that says, you know, what's going on here? If you see dramatic increases in inventory and accounts receivable, then that's where most companies go wrong, that they're not collecting their, their cash, their accounts receivable fast enough, and they're holding on to too much inventory the excess of inventory, you have too much inventory, it's not cash in the bank. And then oftentimes, then your accounts payable will then go way up, that you owe a lot more money, well you owe a lot more money because you don't have any cash. Additionally, if we go look at our lower sections here, you know, if this was planned that we're going to increase our business, uh, you know, Sorry, if we're going to increase our business and that we were going to sell off a bunch of our investments to finance that, right, so that we'd have the cash for it, that's perfect. But if we turn around and look at uh, another uh, statement of cash flows and we see that we have huge increases in equipment, you know, and, and that uh, we sold a tremendous amount of bonds so that we could have the cash for that. If it's not planned, if that's you know not part of the big game plan, then again you're going to have that little red flag that pops up that says, okay, what's going on? So the original interpretation or the original step is for you to be able to make the statement of cash flows and then what's the second most important is can you interpret the statement of cash flows. All right, that's a really rough, rough overview of the statement of cash flows. It's a complex topic. Please be sure to read your chapters and uh, I think that we're just going to call that a day. All right, thanks.